In Europe, there were many medieval knights whose skill and bravery earned them the respect of their contemporaries. Some were chivalrous and adhered to a code of honour, others were merciless and used any means available to defend their monarch, religion, or land. But just who were these warrior men? Let's travel back in time now and take a look at the exploits of some of the medieval protectors who have left their mark in history. Life was simpler back in the medieval period. Although you might get struck down by a tooth infection, at least you didn't have to worry about accidentally drunk dialing your ex or finding out that your phone number, address, and other personal data was being sold to people to make a profit out of you. Life is more complicated, but it doesn't need to be. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Aura, for helping make our lives that bit easier by providing an all-in-one service to help keep you safe online. If you've ever been bored and tried Googling yourself, you might have seen your personal information on a public site being sold by data brokers. We don't all have the time to track down every time that happens, but Aura can help by sending requests to make the brokers remove your information. For one affordable price, Aura offers parental controls, password management, data protection, and more. It's made my life so much easier as I don't have to worry about scammers getting hold of my details or those annoying robotic calls. You can try out yourself for two weeks by using my link, aura.com slash medieval madness, or by clicking the link in the description. And now for today's video, welcome to Medieval Madness. William Marshall, the first Earl of Pembroke. Born in 1146 or 7, William was the youngest son of John Marshall, a minor nobleman. When King Stephen took the English throne in 1135, John supported him but changed sides four years later to help the Empress Matilda with her claim for succession. Stephen besieged Newbury Castle in 1152 when William was just six years old. Stephen took the boy as a hostage to make sure that John would surrender. But even after threatening to hang the child, John refused to yield, saying, quote, I still have the hammer and the anvil with which to forge still more and better sons. William was eventually released months later following the end of the Civil War with the knowledge that the only person he could ever rely on was himself. At the age of 12, William was sent to France for training as a knight. He learned the skill of tournament jousting, winning more than 500 bouts, and served in the household of Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, where his reputation for chivalry grew. In 1170, King Henry II of England appointed William tutor in arms to his son Henry, the young king. When the boy turned against his father, and then later against his brother, Richard the Lionheart, William remained neutral during the Plantagenet family infighting and tried to hold the warring relatives together. As young Henry lay on his deathbed, he asked William to take up the cross and undertake a crusade to Jerusalem. William spent two years in the Holy Land and swore to join the Knights Templar. By 1189, Richard was king, and William was made Lord Protectorate a year later when Richard went off on a crusade. In 1215, William helped to negotiate the terms of the Magna Carta, which was essentially a peace treaty between King John and a group of rebellious barons. Then he was again given the role of de facto king in 1216 when King John died, and his son Henry III was still only an infant. After serving five kings, William died peacefully in 1219, aged 72, and was buried in the Temple Church, London. He had lived a successful life as a warrior, jouster, peacekeeper, and stand-in king. It's no wonder he was the inspiration for Sir Lancelot in the Arthurian legends. He was described by the 13th century English cardinal Stephen Langert as the best knight who ever lived. Vladislaw III Vladislaw became king of Poland at the age of just 10 after his father Vladislaw II died in the 48th year of his reign. The boy king was surrounded by a group of advisors that included the powerful Cardinal Olesniki, who had his own agenda and wanted to carry on enjoying his high court status. A conspiracy began among the Polish nobles to unseat the young king and place Frederick of Brandenburg in his place. He was betrothed to Princess Hedwig, Vladislaw's half-sister, who believed she had a claim to the throne. The plan failed when Hedwig died, and there were rumours that she had been poisoned by Vladislaw's mother, Queen Sophia. In 1440, when he was 16, Vladislaw was offered the crown of Hungary because King Albert II had died without an heir. To accept would mean that Vladislaw would be placed in a precarious position as Albert's widow. Elizabeth wanted to keep the throne for her yet unborn child. Not only that, but some of the Polish nobility did not agree with Vladislaw being king of both countries, and Hungary was under threat from the Ottoman Empire. Nevertheless, Vladislaw began a two-year civil war with Elizabeth, which saw him finally take the Hungarian throne with the help of Pope Eugene IV. 
For this support, Vladislaw had promised to organize an anti-Muslim crusade and was now gripped with a passion to defend Christianity against the infidels. He had been brought up as a pious Christian and was probably spurred on by the success of John Hunyadi and the Hungarian Knights' long campaign against the Turks. In 1444, Vladislaw went ahead with a new campaign against the Ottomans. With Hunyadi in command of his multi-ethnic army, Vladislaw arrived in Varna on the shores of the Black Sea in Bulgaria. A Venetian fleet was supposed to meet them there, but failed to arrive, and this left the 20,000 crusaders stranded near to the huge Ottoman army of 60,000 men. Despite the Ottoman army having three times as many men and being led by Sultan Murad II, there were times when it looked as though the crusaders might win. But then Vladislaw, along with 500 of his Polish knights, made a brave but rash charge directly towards the Ottoman center. Vladislaw's horse was injured, and the king was decapitated at just 20 years old by an Ottoman mercenary. Scrambling to recover Vladislaw's body and organize a retreat, Hunyadi was lucky to escape with his life. The Crusaders suffered thousands of casualties. King Vladislaw's body and head were never found, but he is still admired for his courage, and a monument stands near to where he died. The Black Douglas Sir James Douglas was a Scottish lord. His father, Sir William, had been a loyal supporter of William Wallace in the early days of the First War of Scottish Independence, fought in the late 13th and early 14th centuries. Born around 1286, Douglas joined Robert the Bruce, King of the Scots, in his fight against Edward II of England, and helped to keep the enemy in the south so that Bruce could campaign in the north. With one of his raids, it is easy to see how he got his fearsome reputation for ruthlessness and his nickname, The Black. English forces had occupied his ancestral home of Douglas Castle. On Palm Sunday, 1308, Douglas took a small troop of men and sneaked into the area under cover of Selkirk Forest. They hid under the English garrison left for church, and then ambushed them as they were leaving. Douglas and his men took their prisoners down to the cellar, where they were beheaded. After bursting open the wine casks, the bodies were piled on top and set alight. Before leaving the castle, Douglas ordered the wells to be poisoned with the carcasses of dead horses and salt. This event became legendary and was known as the Douglas Larder. On another occasion, Douglas used subterfuge to capture Roxburgh Castle in 1313 when he disguised his men as oxen, after which the English king described him as cunning and brilliant. Douglas fought at Robert the Bruce's side during the Battle of Bannockburn, where they took a decisive win and continued his raids across the Scottish border into England, where he was greatly feared. Geoffroy de Charny Charny was born into minor French nobility around the year 1306. The Hundred Years' War, which lasted for 116 years, began in 1337, and it was then that Charny began his rise through the French military. He led a cavalry charge at the Battle of Morlakes, but was captured by the English and held for ransom. As a crusader, he was condemned for his bravery by Pope Clement VI. In 1351, he helped to establish the Order of the Star, an elite chivalric company, and was commissioned by the French King Philippe VI to write a set of works about the art of being a knight. The knight's own book of chivalry has since been a valuable historical source on the self-sacrifice and honor needed to be a successful knight. After taking part in the crusading expedition to Smyma in 1344, Sharni was awarded the honor of royal counselor and bearer of the sacred battle standard, the Oriflame. Carrying the crown standard into battle was a dangerous job and proved to be Charny's downfall as he was killed at the Battle of Poitiers in 1356. Charny was a pious man and is recorded as being the first person to take possession of the Shroud of Turin, which he may have acquired whilst on crusade. The chronicler Gilles Lemusid wrote of him, quote, a vigorous soldier, expert in weaponry, and much renowned both overseas and here. He has taken part in many wars and in many mortal conflicts, in all of them conducting himself with probity and with nobility. The court historian Jean Froizard said he was the most worthy and valiant of them all. Henry Percy, Harry Hotspur like many of his peers, Harry Percy began his knightly career quite young. He was just 13 when he was knighted and was taking part in battles from the age of 14. He was born in Northern England into the powerful Percy family who were the Earls of Northumberland and fierce defenders of England from their home on the Scottish border. Percy was only 20 when he was appointed Warden of the East March in 1384 and travelled with King Richard II on his expedition into Scotland a year later. There, because of his speed in advance and readiness to attack, he was given the name Hotspur by the Scots. 
At 22, he led raids into Picardy, France to reinforce the English garrison in Calais. At just 24, he was made a Knight of the Garter for his service and Lieutenant of the Duchy of Aquitaine, age 30. Despite being bestowed with royal grants and appointments, the Percy family decided to support Henry Bolingbroke in his rebellion against Richard II. When Richard was successfully deposed and Bolingbroke became King Henry IV, Harry Percy and his family were lavishly rewarded, and Harry was made Royal Lieutenant of Wales. Never satisfied for long, and with several grievances against the new king, the Percy family rebelled again in 1403, and Harry was killed at the Battle of Shrewsbury. He was 39. When Harry Percy's body was brought to him after the battle, King Henry is said to have wept. Gott von Berlichingen Gottfried von Berlichingen was born into German nobility around 1480. He began his military service for Frederick I, Margrave of Brandenburg, and Spag in 1497 at just 17 years old. The following year, he fought for the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I in France and Brabant, as well as in the Swabian War in 1499. It was during this war that Belichigan was invited to surrender by a Swabian general and made the famous reply, Er kann mich an Arsk lecken, which translates as, He can lick my ass. A phrase that became known as the Swabian Salute in his honour. By 1500, he had formed a group of mercenaries and worked for a succession of margraves, barons, and dukes. During the War of the Succession of Landshut in 1504, Berlichigan and his mercenaries fought for Albert IV, Duke of Bavaria. Cannon fire hit Berlichigan's sword and forced it deep into his arm. His hand and wrist had to be amputated. Determined that the injury would not hinder his fighting career, he commissioned a local blacksmith to make a prosthetic iron hand that was capable of holding a sword. He became known as Gotts of the Iron Hand and continued fighting in various military campaigns, including the German Peasants' War. Despite his disability, Berlichigan fought in many feuds, at least 15 were fought in his own name, and others were to help his friends in cities such as Cologne, Ulm, and Augsburg. One was even against the Bishop of Bamberg. Berlichigan left an autobiography in which he related his exploits during a long military career that lasted for 47 years. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Hope you've learned a thing or two here, and I'll see you next week for another video. Have a great week. Cheers.